Good afternoon or morning to everybody and uh, welcome to Book Fest Fall 2022. With me is Angela Ball and she is the CEO of IBPA and on February 1st we'll take over as CEO of the publishing technology company Firebrand Group. Hi Angela and welcome to Book Fest. It's great to have you here. Hi Mandy. Yeah, this is exciting. This is really great. It is. I haven't seen you since Austin. Pub you in Austin. Which feels like forever ago. Lots has happened since we were, and I mean, I think that must have been 2017, 2016 yeah. or 2017. Yeah, the world the world yeah. has changed a lot. It's been a while. It has. Yeah, it has. Um, now, I was thinking because agility is the theme of our conversation, I thought it'd be great if we start with your career path in the book world. So let's begin with your education and what sparked your initial interest in studying book publishing at university? Yeah, so I my education, I guess it spanned a lot of things. I was a very curious college student. Thank goodness I paid for it myself or I probably my parents would never speak to me again. But I, I did a lot of different programs through undergrad, but I did settle in literature and in what was called gender studies at the time. And that's where my degrees came in. And I always, always loved books and reading. I think that's what we have in common in the book industry. Even people that work in the operations and technology side of the book industry will talk to you for days about what they love to read. So I was always a huge reader. Um, and when I got out, I, I did a number of different kind of young 20s things, eventually settling in an independent bookstore where I learned a lot more about the industry from that side of things. and. Had a really good relationship with uh, the Random House sales rep at the time. And she talked to me about what it was like to live in New York City and work in big publishing and have this very exciting life, as I, as I understood it, because I was uh, living in Wyoming at the time. And uh, it felt right to me. So I, I moved to New York City to go to the NYU graduate program in book publishing. And all of this stuff, you know, I, I didn't come from a family that was particular. I mean, I was the first one to go to college. There wasn't a lot of connections that I had that I was able to to use to get into an industry of any kind, really. So these places that I found, particularly through the education and through the NYU graduate program, were really pivotal for me. And I'm I'm grateful that I did it. Sometimes, you know, going back to school isn't always isn't always recommended. It can kind of sometimes. I mean, I don't want to like bash it, but sometimes it can be a waste of time. Um, unless you can really kind of turn it to your advantage. And I, the, the uh, network that I made through the NYU publishing program as a young person was really, really important. So yeah, I, I recommend it if you can go to school for something that you absolutely know you want to do. Um, yeah. You can jump right into that. So that, yeah. that pretty much jump started my career is being able to come to New York City for that program. You know, it's funny because when I interview people, I always look for little threads that kind of bring us together, you know, and the thread with you was you were book buying for a bookshop in Jackson, Wyoming, right? Yeah. So that, that was the Wyoming, yeah, Jackson, Wyoming. Yeah. And that's where we had, um, my youngest son was born and we lived there for a while and it's mm -hmm. a great little town. I love it. And also I have such a connection with independent bookshops, but, um, you know, I, I love your background in just reading. I think that you've nailed it. That is what brings us all together in this industry. We all just love to read, right? We love it. We do. And yeah. I think a lot of us connect to how reading has expanded our experiences, you know, the windows, at least that aspect of it. It's also, we can talk about the doors, but I think for me, that's what I, I love talking to bookish people because they have a lot to talk about because their experiences yeah. are broader than their own because they read all the time. And I, I think that that's one of the things that really draws me into this industry and why I really love it. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Now, publishing companies began forming what, I think it was in the 1500s, and now we're reading books on our cell phones. It's just crazy, talk about agility. <laughs> um, but apart from eBooks, what do you see as significant contributions contributors to the growth and change of the book publishing industry. So if we took the ebook scenario out of it, because we all know that that's so big, what else do you see there? Yeah, 
Well, I I will say one tiny thing about the ebooks, not to kind of leave them in the dust, because what I what is interesting, I think, about ebooks is that yes, they're definitely revolutionary and have changed the industry, but not to the degree that everybody thought that they would. And I I do think that that's something that may shift and change in the future. But you know, since they became on the market and have been on the market, they've been about thirty percent of the market, and they really haven't changed much in terms of um, you know how much they've infiltrated things. So people still like print, they're still reading print, digital is available, but the print market feels strong. And that's, you know, kind of leads to one of the things that I think has been, has made things more agile and self-published authors will really lean into this, which is print on demand. So huge without print on demand um, and particularly the companies that that work with print on demand exclusively, I don't think we'd have the self-publishing market that we have today for sure. So that was a huge change for the industry. Um, we're definitely seeing audiobooks make waves now. And a lot of people are saying that where ebooks kind of topped out at that 30% of the market, there people don't really see an end for where audiobooks could potentially tap out in the market. I am interested in that. There is only so much time. But the thing about an audiobook is you can do so many other things while you listen. Think about an ebook or a paper book is you kind of just do that thing. Like, you know, you can read an ebook and also wash the dishes very well, but you can wash your dishes and listen to an audiobook. So I, I get why people think that the audiobook market could saturate more than the ebook market has. And I think that is a very interesting market to watch. Um, and with that, subscriptions. Spotify just added, I think they just added uh, audiobooks and subscription services will become something that I think every publisher will need to contend with. Haven't quite had to contend with because it hasn't been a huge part of how people access book content, but I think subscription services will become something to think about too. The other thing too is uh, with audio, AI is becoming so much better than it ever was. So yeah. while I love the human voice, I can see how uh, AI, now it's hard to tell the difference. When I've listened to a few recordings of parts of books that have been done in AI, it's actually really good. I yeah. wouldn't even know how to tell if it was AI <laughs> or human, and that's probably gonna make people mad at me. But yeah, we did, a IBPA just did a webinar last week or this week or something. We have a member benefit, uh, the association that I work for, the Independent Book Publishers Association. We have a member benefit with it. AI service and just did a webinar with them explaining how it was or how, how it works or what it does. And it, to, I'll be honest to me, it's still a little sci-fi, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely out there. Yeah. It's exciting. It is exciting. Um, now I've got a few figures here, so I'm going to read these. Publishers Global states, we now have over 20,000 publishing companies in 132 countries. Words rated figures for 2022 show that 30 to 34% of all eBooks sold are self-published, that Amazon pays $250 million in royalties to self-published authors each year. And I love this one. Women write 67% of top rated self-published books compared to just 39 percent of traditionally published books i actually found that quite a good uh you know stat i thought it was interesting it isn't easy to find exact figures on regarding self-publishing for quite a few different reasons for example some people don't use isbn numbers etc but something that is really dear to my heart let's discuss the importance for self-published authors to consider the publishing guidelines created by IBP, IBPA. Yeah. So if you can share that, because I, I think it's great and I turn a lot of my students onto that. Uh, it's just such a great asset they have there. And that actually part is free on your page. We do have a lot of uh, free content. When we, as a professional trade association, a big mandate of ours has got to be to promote professional standards in our yes. so, you know, within our industry, so we will do that. And I, you know, I, I don't think IVPA can take full credit for any of these professional standards. Really, we just they're set by other groups too, and we kind of consolidate them and talk through them. So you know, barcoding standards are set by the Book Industry Study Group, for example, and we'll just kind of point to those. Um, but it is really important. You said there's 20,000 publishers, and I thought, well, I don't know, there's a lot more than that. I mean, if you'd consider the ones that are just going through KDP, for example, yeah. 
And if these these folks, um, the authors, if you will, um, that are publishing through KDP, <coughs> excuse me, also think about themselves as publishers, which we would hope that they do, then they're professional publishers and, and the standards we think matter. Um, I don't know. I think that consumers do tell a book by its cover. I think when you're publishing, even if, again, you're just going through KDP platform, you are publishing alongside the big five and you are in competition with the big five books and your book should stand alongside those just as well as the others. And that goes straight through the content, which obviously should be good and well edited, but to the design of the cover as well, that it looks like a book in the genre in which it's published. Um, that the data is clean and clear and good. Um, and that's just to your own benefit, because if you have that book to be found and purchased by anybody, the metadata should be really clean and clear and should speak well to the book and have great SEO. There's I, sometimes I wonder why anybody gets into the business of book publishing. <laughs> Plus, there's so much to learn. <laughs> I'm obviously very intrigued by it and really energized by it. But I I just hats off to authors that um, not only yeah. create the content, but then also take the next step, which is to create professionally published packaging for that content. It's, it's a big job. And for anybody listening or watching um, this section, um, we'll put the link to that directly for um, IBPA for those standards, uh, probably in the chat somewhere. Mm -hmm. But also, I think you can go to IBPA, just Google IBPA, guidelines, publishing guidelines, and I think you'll find it. It just pops up pretty quickly. But it kind of leads me on to my next question. Why do self-published authors need to understand how the traditionally publishing, traditional publishing industry works? And for me, this was fascinating because as I said earlier, before we went on air, I was uh, you know, doing all this research on you and I went down a few rabbit holes and one of them took me to your um, class that you give at the UCLA Extension. And I thought, man, that would be such an asset to anybody who took that class because you do talk about this subject. Yeah, I, I have taught that the UCLA extension class that I teach is on publishing business models, essentially for authors. So if you want to publish and you want to figure out how to do it, we do talk about traditional publishing and hybrid publishing if you want to go that route. But we focus a lot on self-publishing because most of these authors have decided by that by the point that they pay for a class at UCLA extension that that's a route that they really want to explore. Yeah. And it's a tricky answer to the question, why should you care or learn the traditional um, industry? Because some somebody could say to me, I don't care and I won't. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be like, cool, I, great. I mean, maybe you can find a way to, to push through in that space. And breaking the rules isn't necessarily a terrible thing as long as you understand the rules that you're breaking. So there's a lot about the traditional publishing industry that just it doesn't really work well for them, much less for a self-published author who's got a different kind of business model and a way of working. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you have to completely follow all the tenets of traditional publishing in order to be successful. I think you have to understand why they're there because many is, I think you said the 1500s, many hundreds of years of publishing innovation has gone into this space. And there's a reason for a lot of these things. There's some things that you'll learn and you'll think, well, that's a dumb reason and it doesn't apply to me. So I'm going to do it a little bit differently. And I think that that's OK. I think you can break the rules once you understand how the rules are applied and why they're applied. Yeah, I will give you a for some people will find this a very exciting example and some will find it a super eggheady and not interesting example. <laughs> and it's about printing the price on your barcode, which is yes. something that self-published authors often don't do they you know and they're often advised not to do i think even amazon says don't print the price because you you want to change it over and over um, when you're selling it online you want to raise it you want to lower it and um and there's a lot of reasons why not to print the price in the barcode but one reason to do it is because barnes and noble requires it and if you have a book that you want to get out into traditional spaces you have to understand those rules and why they're there so people have come to us who've met with their local Barnes and Noble and they want to carry the book and then they get hit with, well, we're going to charge you back for this. It's not actually, you know, structured correctly. We can't actually get it in store because you didn't follow the rules. So it just stops you at a certain point in your, in your publishing, if you're not following the rules. 
Yeah. You know, there's an interesting um, little uh, tidbit of information about that too, is sometimes when Ingram changes their pricing, you will have to change your whole <laughs> cover if you have the price in the barcode because of that if you you know you have to change your pricing so there's just so many parts to publishing that you really have to understand and it takes years it takes years and i can see why hybrid publishing is becoming popular um because you can just kind of hand it all over to someone mm -hmm. But, you know, there are hybrid publishers and there are hybrid publishers. So, you know, you do need to be careful. Now, it goes without saying, I am a big fan of independent bookshops. And when I started the Bookshop podcast, I had a lot of self-published authors emailing me or DMing me saying, you know, that's great that you love independent bookshops, but they're not going to take our books because we're self-published. You know, we tell them we sell a lot on Amazon and I'm just kind of giggling to myself thinking, okay, well, you know, that's a bit of a mistake there going in and, and mouthing off about Amazon, you know. But I have brought this up time and time again with many of the independent bookshop owners. And here is what they say. First of all, build a relationship with the booksellers the book buyers, the owners of the indie bookshops, and they'll say, and ask yourself, where do I buy my books? So in other words, my little uh, independent bookshop is Bart's Books, which is world renowned. It's a great little bookshop. Uh, I can email them. I need this, 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 and this. See if you've got it in stock. If not, I'll, I'll order it. And I go in there and sometimes they have a pile high from me because they know my taste. They know what I'm researching at the time. And so this is what they mean by where do you buy your books? Mm. Do you support local businesses? So I think it's really important for self-published authors and small and medium presses to understand it takes a lot to build relationships with these bookshop owners. Um, so with that in mind, let's talk about distribution because that has always been like a little bit of a needle for self-published authors. Uh, are there any companies doing distribution now for um you know smaller companies for self-published authors and because most of us go to ingram spark mm -hmm. uh, because the other side of this too is that for when an indie bookshop owner is doing their ordering it's very difficult if they've got you know numerous little tiny accounts they want to have the big accounts that they can order from so if we could have that discussion i think that would be really interesting to a lot of self-published authors. Absolutely. Um, the, the first thing to, to uh, I don't know, to, yeah, the first thing I would say is there is a, there's a big difference between distribution and wholesale, but having a distributor and having a wholesaler, I think those two things get kind of uh, intermingled and, and confused sometimes. And we talk about that a lot with our members. So I think at the very, very least, it's great for a self-published author to go through Ingram via Ingram Spark, or if you have a Lightning Source account, that's another way to get through. If you don't have a traditional distributor, which is the organization that's going to have that relationship in the, or those relationships with the different bookshops and specialty shops and Walmart.coms and Target.coms, you know they're they're kind of the middleman to get the books into um, these spaces. If you don't have that company, you at least need to be, I think, through Ingram available through Ingram, because your point, Mandy, is completely true. The bookshops don't want to create a one-off invoice sheet with you, you know, Angela Bull. Like, they do not want to do that. They want to grab your book through Ingram when they grab 50 other books from 50 other publishers, and they want to consolidate that work. So being available where other books are available in the trade market is really important. And it's also I, I almost want to say impossible. If you have one book or two books or sometimes even just five or five books, it's kind of impossible to get a traditional distributor. You really have to prove that you have lots of books in the pipe already and lots of books coming because it's got to be a long game and distributors don't want to spend a lot of time teaching somebody how the industry works only to have that kind of, this sounds harsh, but die on the vine because there's no more content coming from that person that they can then take advantage of. So it's a it's a heavy lift to get somebody into the system and they need to see that there's longevity with that partner in order to keep them or, or in order to bring them into the system. So, so that's key. So getting traditional distribution is gonna be hard. So 
So you're probably going to have wholesale distribution, which just means you're going to be available to these bookstores. Mm -hmm. But then you have to make sure that if the bookstore market is indeed a market that you want to play in, because some author publishers rightly say it's not, I do fine on Amazon and I'm not even going to try. And then, okay. but if it is a market you want to play in, you have to set the right discounts and you have to be returnable. And sometimes it, each step of this process is like a, it's like a wall for some authors are like, well, I'm willing to give you the right discounts, but I won't take returns or I'm willing to yeah. do what I won't do this. And these are definitely fine decisions there to make. You can make your own decisions. That's why you're an independent author because you want to make your own decisions. But if those are decisions you made, then you've shut the door on these particular channels. So be available where they order, which is for the most part, the easiest way to do that is through Ingram spark or lightning source set the right discounts and make sure your books are returnable. And then what you said, make the personal relationships, but those personal relationships won't go anywhere or anywhere unless your books are properly set in the system for them to, to get very easily. Yeah. So there's a lot of good information. There. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, and it is possible. I don't want to turn, I'm not trying to turn people off by saying, no, you're never going to be out again to bookshops because I don't believe that. Yeah. I have friends that are self-published. They are in airports because they've worked their butts off going around making these relationships. So it is possible. It just takes a lot of work. And like you said, you've got to have your books available in the correct uh, formats and distribution places to you know, wholesale to get them out there. Mm -hmm. Now, a little later today, Bookfest is holding a panel regarding one of my favorite topics, which is author platforms. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to have an author platform. And even with all of the traditional publishers that I have spoken with on the show, and also, you know, some pretty big time authors, they're all working on their author platforms. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the importance of building that platform and what it looks like. And what are your thoughts on that? I am some, okay, full disclosure, I am someone without social media. So this is coming from that kind of space and point of view. I, I, I understand and I do think the author platform is really important. And I actually think maybe a little bit more so even in the self-published space, because you're not going to have the support of the publisher um, or the distributor or the other people in the supply chain to help get your book out there. When you are self-published, you are the one, uh, you're your entire marketing system, you hold the bullhorn completely. So you have to be visible. And I think you have to be authentically visible too in the different spaces that make sense for what you're doing. So I mean, you know, everybody knows they see some people on social that's they're just pushing their stuff and pushing, 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 and they're not giving anything. They're just asking and they're not providing. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship across platforms. You know, you're in a platform, you're talking with people, it's an authentic relationship. Um, and that that can be really important. I've heard um I actually heard uh, Brooke Warner, who uh, runs, she writes press, and she wrote a book called Greenlight Your Book that talks about author platform a bit. And she might have changed her point of view on this in a while. So I, I will attribute this to when the book first came out. But she does talk about how she left Seal Press because she saw Seal Press lean from her perspective a little bit too much into you must have an author platform or we will not publish you. And that she just realized there was a lot of really great content that people were writing, but they weren't people who were known. You know, there were people like me, like I mentioned, with no connections. Had I not gone to NYU, nobody, you know, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a platform. Um, you have to make those connections. And and it just how frustrated she was with that part of traditional publishing, that it was becoming more and more about whether you already had a name and less and less about whether you had a great story to tell or good content. Um, that you could bring to the table. And so there's tension there, you know? I, yes, you have to have a great platform, but maybe there are other things that you also bring to the table and you have to be able to talk about what that looks like. And if you're not really, really great on Twitter or Facebook or wherever these social media platforms are being developed, it almost feels bad for you to even be there because it's like wasted space and you, everyone can tell that you know, it's, you're there by you're grudgingly participating or, or something like that. It has to feel authentic. Um, so, you know, and then maybe there, if, if online socials aren't your thing, maybe there are physical places you could be 
And you could think about your platform as where are you going? Are you going to book fairs? You know, are you talking, are you trying to talk to groups of people in a physical space? You know, there's different ways to be platformed that aren't all social platform too. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring you bring up two things there that I want to talk about. I've actually um, interviewed a few of Brooks' authors on on the show, um, and then mostly they have come through. No, they've all come through uh, PR people, and that's something else that I think is really important. If you can find a marketing or a PR person to promote your books, I know it's expensive, but for people like me who have podcasts where we interview authors. It's really great to get a professional looking uh, format and, and, a, and a letter of introduction from a PR person introducing the book and having a really great, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. You know, and they tell you all about the person, the, the author in their book. Yeah. It's super important to look professional if you want to be on different uh, podcasts and TV shows or blogs, whatever. You just have to have that edge. Uh, because otherwise we get inundated with, you know, people that could be really, could have really good books, but there's a professionalism that has to come through, I think, you know. Um, the other thing that you brought up was, uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, with social media, I think that there's a lot of people selling books on, well, I know they are on Book Talk, right? Through TikTok. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, it takes so much time. I, there's no way I could do it. I've tried it and it's just too much time. And uh, so you really do have to be dedicated. And I thoroughly uh, agree with you about choosing, even if it's just one social media platform, but it's not just about you. You have to figure out where your group is, you know, where your tribe is that are gonna buy your book. The other thing that I think we miss is, um, you might not be on social media, but you might be a really good public speaker. Right. You might have something that is a subject in your book that you are quite knowledgeable about and that people will want to talk to you about. So it's not always about being an author so much as having this other side of you that stands out a little bit. Yeah. I just think that's incredibly important. And you can do it um, as an introvert which is what yes. I, you know, I mean, there's, there's definitely then afterwards the downtime that's required, but you know, introversion doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you have something to say and can say it, you know, well to a group of people that, that can happen. Um, so I don't think that that should feel like a stopping force for folks. If they feel like they're introverted, I think that it's still possible to do that well. Um, just make sure that you book that extra two hours afterward that you can just go sit in a dark room if you need to and recollect <laughs> collect your thoughts. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting thing. And I love your point about PR and that you found your authors through PR because that another thing we we've talked we talk a lot about with folks is that, you know, there is an expense to publishing your work. There's, you know, you got to get the cover designed and the production and the editorial and stuff. And that's just to get the thing finished. But there's also money to be spent on stuff like PR and marketing. And that should be part of the expectation that it's not just making the book available and then you're done and then it's just going to take off. I mean, I feel like even when I say that, it feels too simplistic to even mention or need to mention. But yeah, I mean, you can't just put it up for sale and then kind of wait and see there's there's a lot of other things that could happen and it depends on how much you want to invest in this and, and where where you're going to take it but investing in pr investing in marketing it can help it's super super important i think the the key word is professionalism yeah make it as professional right. as you can and it's always people say self-publishing. I really don't like that term. I think indie publishing probably is a little closer because it's such an oxymoron. Because if you're self-publishing, you most people I know who do it have a great team behind them. They have that whole team, you know. Um, and you just choose the things that you can do well. And then you have to kind of make a list of the things that you can kind of let go of and the things that you definitely want to let go of and, and just yeah. let a professional take over yeah and that's how i feel about social media <laughs> i'm not <laughs> authentic in those spaces i'm not i'm not good in those spaces so that would definitely be for me a space where i would either i would just have to either not live there or have somebody live yeah. there for me 
Yeah, no, and that's good, but that's you understand that. So that's the mm -hmm. part of learning the lesson, I think, to do with self-publishing. Um, now let's talk a little about your time at IBPA. To you, what are some of the real, in looking back at your prof professional life there that you feel really proud about? And I don't want you to cry because I'm, I'm sure you have an attachment no. to <laughs> Yeah, so I've been there nine years and four months, I know, because I just wrote my last letter um, to membership. I I mean, my last letter was a ton of thank yous, to, to be frank. Like, there's just been, uh, what am I super proud of? I think just having the experience of having been able to work with independent publishers at that level for so long. I'm I'm honored to have been able to do that. I'm, I'm proud of the work that we accomplished. I mean, we could say things. We we did grow membership. We did add dozens of new member benefits, um, some new partner programs. We you know we shifted through. We've increased revenue. Like things have happened that have been really good for the community and to make IVPA a very stable organization. Um, but the things that I'm most proud of, I I hope that people have felt through my tenure like they're part of a community and that they're in this space together and that they have each other to lean on and to work with as they're you know, independently publishing from the largest independent publishers down to the single book self-published authors. That's a lot of space in there for folks uh, to engage. And I that, that really, yeah, I mean, I could go on more about that. I, I feel like IDPA, it's in, in what it is in its DNA is a community building space. Their, the motto is helping each other achieve and succeed. So to be able to foster those connections, I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I know it will continue. IBPA has been going to celebrate its 40th anniversary in 2023. So it's got a really bright future ahead of it. And they're going to bring in a really whip smart new CEO that's going to take it into the 40th year. Um, I'm excited to see that. I don't think it'll ever lose its community based roots. And where is PubU going to be this year or next year? Is it next year, April? Is that right or something like that? Yeah, well, it'll be the, um, so Publishing University is IVPA's annual conference. And I, I do think it's joyful. It has been very joyful. Um, next year, it'll be the first weekend in May, I think. And it will be in Corn on Coronado Island, which is right outside San Diego, California. So most people don't know about Coronado Island, but they do know San Diego. If you get to San Diego, you just take a bridge over and you're on Coronado Island. And I promise you, you'd rather be on Coronado Island than, <laughs> than downtown San Diego. Downtown San Diego is great. You can get there really quickly, um, but it's beautiful. It's it's like a, a little resorty kind of spot. Yeah, you can do some kayaking and everything while you're there too. It's great. They'll give you kayaks for free. Yeah. Wow, there you, you go. From the, I guess, the resort. Uh, yeah, you can get kayaks for yeah. free. No, it's great. And I def definitely recommend it. I went to, as I was saying earlier, the one in Austin, and it was more about just meeting people that were going through the same issues as you were going through and, you know, going to all the workshops that you can possibly go to and learning about it. And then, of course, if you can't make all the bookshops, you can tune in later and, and look at them all, which is great. Mm -hmm. So you're always continually learning. Now, tell us a little bit about where you're going. I mean, this is a big step for you. So let's hear all about Firebrand Brand. Firebrand Group. Um, group, yes. I will, I will acknowledge to those listening that actually, Mandy, you asked me a question about Firebrand Group earlier, and I was like, I don't know. I, I really, <laughs> it was she. She had more data on a particular part of the business than I. And that, bookish that I, first. Bookish, bookish first. first. Yeah, we need to look it up. And I and I thought, oh yeah, no, that sounds cool. I'm glad that that's happening. Um, <laughs> Firebrand Group, I, I have, uh, so before I came to IBPA, I worked for the Book Industry Study Group. So to kind of talk, how did this even happen? Like, how am I jumping from the association world to a technology company in the book publishing industry? Um, so I worked for the Book Industry Study Group for also about 10 years. Uh, and I did a lot of standards development and uh, met a lot of people on that side of the business, on the operations side of the business. And one person I met was Fran Tulin, who's the current CEO at Firebrand Group. And uh, yeah, and he he did approach me to see if this might be something I was interested in. He's got extremely big shoes to fill. He founded this company in the 80s and he has run it ever since. And he's done a very exemplary job. Uh, it's one of, you know, there are only a few title management systems 
uh, in the United States serving book publishers. This is one of them. So, you know, it, they're kind of like they're providing the technology that runs publishing businesses um, is one way to think about it. And they also um, have NetGalley on the team, which I think a lot of self-published authors are using NetGalley and a lot of publishers in general. Um, and they have a company called Supadoo, which people might know. Uh, they build websites for publishers and do, you know, gateways, uh, retail gateways for publishing systems. So it eventually, you know, it, it's almost there, but it's going to going to be a company that can really serve from the author, from the content, all the way through to the sale to the reader. And it will have systems in play that kind of help publishers every step of the way. So, yeah, not till February 1st. And there are obviously some things about the company that I still need to learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and does this mean a lo relocating for you or you are you able to stay where you are in LA? It's going to uh it's transitioning to a fully virtual company right now. So everyone will be virtual including me and whether that means I stay in LA or not. I mean that you know now it's we have to who, who knows where anybody's going to live. So mm -hmm. it will be everywhere. It's a inner it's a company owned by uh, a Japanese company called MediaDo. And uh, Supadu is in the UK, so it's already got inter it's international at this point. Well, next time we're talking to you, it could be from Hawaii or somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? <laughs> uh, yeah, and things are opening up. I think that the, the it's good. We I, we have to get together. You and I have both talked about the benefits of being in place together. Um, mm -hmm. Conference time when you came to PubU and when I went to NYU, and you just don't build those relationships as well over Zoom. So we have to keep those things going. Yeah. Well, Zoom is great too. It, it works. It's It's been fantastic. I mean, look mm -hmm. at us. We're talking now. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about books. Tell me mm -hmm. some books that you've loved and what are you currently reading? Oh, um, currently I'm, well, I, I guess I'm on to the next, but I read Kindred. Um, by Butler, Octavia, Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I loved it. And I read it for my book club and uh, everybody in book club loved it. My book club's pretty big. <laughs> um, and I went on to read Parable of the Sower and I read Parable of the Talents. And now I've just become a huge Butler fan. And I should have known because we talked about her when I was an undergrad and uh, her uh. books were circulating around as something that would be important to read, but it was never required reading so I never did there's enough to read it as a literature major but it's fantastic so I, I definitely recommend those um, but yeah I don't know I'm in a book club that reads a lot <laughs> so our uh, next book coming up I don't even remember what it's called so I have to I have to get I have to get reconnected to it yeah yeah oh my goodness and is there a book that you I, i'm an avid rereader i love rereading books so is there a book that you or or books that you reread every few years or every year i have never reread a book i have never a movie i've never i've never done it i i don't know that there's enough time to even read all the things that i want to read i have i don't i guess that's a one, I reread A Wrinkle in Time for my book club, which I read as a tiny child. And I remember really, really loving it as a kid. And then I reread it about two years ago for my book club and I didn't like it. So maybe don't don't reapproach your darlings because, you know, I, we're, I'm different. Uh, I'm definitely older, but none of, nobody in book club really loved it as grownups reading A Wrinkle in Time, Madeline Lingle. So but that was that's all I can. That's the only one I can remember that I've ever reread I just there's too much to read yeah what's gosh. you have one that you've always that you oh, I have about 10 I mean <laughs> I, I literally just finished one a while ago for for the show and I can't wait to get back to it again um mm -hmm. it was the descendants no no it's not it's not called the descendants it's called um oh I can't think what it's called now the displacements by Bruce Holsinger brilliant book mm -hmm. uh but there are books that I know that I think I wish everyone would read this book. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of those? Do you have any of that kind of book where you think, oh, if everyone would read this, that'd be great. I'd love to see more people reading this. I I feel on this. I wish I could name more. I 
I guess it always changes. Like it depends on what kind of what what kind of flows through. I used to have ready answers to that, but then I got ten years older and twenty years older and thirty years older. From there. <laughs> so like it's a bit different now. I used to always say Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut because that was for me when I read it. I'd never read anything that interesting before. Um, what's the Bay Bayou book? Lincoln and the Bardo. Uh, which is a more recent experience that I had with a book like something like this. So when I first read Kurt Vonnegut, wacky, wild, weird time jumps, planet space was happening. And I was so much younger in high school. And I thought, I didn't even know we could go here. Like I thought we had to be linear and I thought we had to tell a story in this way. And it really kind of definitely blew my mind. And I thought Lincoln and the Bardo was one of the ones coming as a grown up. You know, it's a couple years ago or so that it was published and it was so spooky and so well done and I totally bought it and I believed we were out of the ghosts where I just thought it was told so well. So I think, I think books that kind of help you think differently about what you think reading is are really interesting. And something that I've noticed too in the book publishing industry, uh, since everything we've gone through in the last few years, publishers are really listening and they're doing more books in translation mm -hmm. and they're bringing more authors from different countries and i'm loving this i i'm reading books now that i never would have even thought about reading uh a lot of it is because of the show but i'm just they lead me on to other books so mm -hmm. i'm pretty excited about translations right now i think that's another part of the industry that is exciting to me you know? Yeah. I mean, I, for me, that's a little opaque. I don't even know if I'm reading a translation, to be honest. So yeah, well, it'd be interesting to kind of to look into that. Yeah. Uh, well, the fun thing is you, mm -hmm. you, it's translated, but the way they're writing, you know, you're not reading an, uh, you know, a book written by an American or it, it's just so cool. I love it. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so yeah, I do think that uh, books in translations is, pretty exciting right now. Now, is there anything else before we close that you can think of that you'd like to let our listeners know or anything at all? I think just th thanks for the opportunity. I, as I, I'm wondering, you know, as I move out from IBPA into Firebrand Group and, and things change, it's it really is opportunities like this, being able to talk about books. Like I was kind of, it kind of caught me off guard when you asked me about a book. I thought, I, nobody asks me about what I'm reading or wants to actually talk about books. Like they want to talk about a barcode or what does what should go on the spine, but nobody actually wants to talk about the books. So I think um, this is such a genuine space and being able to to actually talk about the books that was that was pretty joyful. Um, yeah. So yeah, keep. I would say this is a good space to be in. Yeah. And I want to say to thank you to Desiree and Dave for having us and inviting us on the show. It's been wonderful. Uh, Bookfest is just growing in leaps and bounds. And it's exciting. You know, it, all of these things to do with books to me and reading. I just love them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Angela. And to learn more about Angela, uh, you have your own page on the Bookfest website. And uh, so do I. So I just think go and read and uh, let us know you find ways to get in touch with us through those pages. Mm -hmm. Angela, thank you so much. This has been a joy. And I wish you all the best in your new endeavor. Thanks, Mandy. I appreciate it. You too. Thank you.